Welcome to the Ortega Path to Enlightenment. My name is George Ortega, and this is episode number four, Enlightenment and Goodness. And we're recording this on May 2nd, 2017. So basically this series is about like determining what exactly is enlightenment, how can we become either enlightened or more enlightened, and again, this, uh, we're going to talk about goodness today. So basically, it's really impossible to consider oneself enlightened or to be enlightened without not just being good, but being very good. I mean, think about it. Like, enlightenment has various components. You have to be very happy to be enlightened. Um, you have to kind of like perceive reality, the world, accurately. You know, you can't like, for example, believe in a flat earth and, and, and believe you're enlightened. And, and goodness, you know, again, you can't just be good because, you know, most of us are good, good in some ways. Actually, some, all, many of us are like not so good. We don't even realize, you know, the ways in which we're not good. But again, to be a, um, enlightened or very enlightened, you've really got to be good, uh, very good. So, all right, so what is goodness? Um, I think the best definition that I've run across is uh, by the British philosopher John Locke who said that basically goodness is what creates happiness. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, it's not a complete definition. There, there may be some exceptions. You know, it might get complicated in a sense. But, but basically, if you're doing something good, it's going to create happiness either for you or for others or for both. Um, sometimes, you know, it involves, let's say, creating a lot of happiness for a lot of people at your expense to a certain extent. Um, but basically, just yes, goodness is always about creating not just happiness as a state, but also pleasure. You know, we're, we're hardwired as, as human beings to seek pleasure and avoid pain. So goodness is what we define as what helps us navigate this to, to experience the most pleasure, happiness, and least amount of pain, pain, pain and unhappiness. All right, so, and very, very connected to this is compassion. You know, the Buddha understood this. You know, basically, his first of the Four Noble Truths was that life contains suffering. I think sometimes, a lot of times, it's misrepresented as life is suffering or experience is suffering. No, I, I, I don't think he meant that. I think, you know, basically life, we as human beings really, at least not yet, you know, we can't avoid suffering. We suffer, other people suffer, animals suffer. And so basically, a lot of goodness is about keeping this in mind, just cultivating compassion. Compassion isn't just central to um, Buddhism. I think it's central to Hinduism, to Christianity, to Judaism, to Islam. You know, caring about others, you know, loving others. And again, it's all about happiness. It's wanting others to be as happy as they can be, wanting ourselves to be as happy as we can be. All right. so. So basically, in terms of goodness, like, you know, there are different kinds of, like, objects of goodness, you know. First of all, we're going to be good to the people in our lives, you know, our friends, our family, our, our parents, our children, nieces, nephew, cousins, you know, uh, co-workers, the people we see, you know, on a daily basis. It's very important that, that goodness isn't kind of like just at this abstract intellectual concept that we're going to be good to the world, but then not focus on our interactions on a daily basis. So, you know, it's basically about like when we interact with others to keep that in mind and to like say things and do things that are going to help the people in our lives um, just feel happier, just help them avoid suffering. You know, if you've got an answer, if they've got a problem and you've got an answer to it, uh, help them out. If, if they present you with a problem and you don't have an answer to it yet, think about it, then suggest an answer to them. So it's, it's basically about, you know, being good to the people in our lives. Um, but then there's a lot, there are a lot of people that we need to be good to, but we will never meet them. There, there are people that exist in, in different cities, different states, different countries. Uh, often they're very unfortunate. One to two billion people on the planet uh, live in extreme poverty. They, they don't have access to safe drinking water. They, they often, you know, go, you know, securing enough food for one day, for, for each day, is often a struggle for them. Again, this is like, this is about uh, almost a third of the population. Um, 
And like so, like to be very good, you can't ignore that. Now, this to a great extent, it, it does involve societal goodness. In other words, we 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 can't just as individuals. It's very there is not that much we can do to help the less fortunate. You know, to, whether they're poor or they're sick or they're you know they don't have let's say um, basic rights like basic freedoms. Um, there's not sometimes all that much we can do as individuals. So that like that means that like goodness isn't just about how we act as individuals. It's it's also about how we act collectively. What our governments and institutions, including our religions, do to um, to address this. Um, you know, it's it's unfortunate that a lot of like here in the United States, our religions are focused, for example, on on the rights of gays or the rights of women, kind of like actually, you know, denying them. I mean, they're, they're focused on these issues that um, that are, you know, part of their theology or whatever, but, but you don't hear, you don't hear religions talk nearly enough, at least here in the United States, about this, this global poverty, all this suffering, and how it's not just you know, it's not just the obligation of our governments and our collective institutions, it, it's also the obligation of religions, you know, as institutions. So, all right, and you know, there's this concept of noblesse oblige. Um, it's a French term meaning uh, literally obligations of the noble, meaning more so that like if we're fortunate um, in life, if we have enough to eat, if we have our basic needs met, we have an obligation, we have a moral obligation to tend to the needs of those less fortunate. You know, um, those to those, those to whom great fortune has been bestowed, great demands are made. There's, I'm paraphrasing a, um, a statement regarding that. But um, again, it, it's, it's a moral obligation. We, we can't just say, well, I'm lucky, they're not, it's not my fault, and then just like be indifferent to that. That's again, like if we're talking about enlightenment, um, you have to be very good in this regard. You have to be doing something, you know, in your life that's going to like, you know, either directly or indirectly or both help those of us who are least fortunate. And a very a very important part of this is that we cannot just limit this compassion, this caring to to people because like we share this planet with billions and billions and billions of animals, of, of, of other sentient life, these, these other animals that feel pain just as strongly as, as we do. And for example, like with animals, um, here in the United States only about three and a half percent of us are vegans, meaning we refuse to eat um, animal products because we know, we know the, the, the suffering that these animals go through in the process of being raised and then slaughtered, you know, in these factory farms that are like unbelievably cruel. So, so again, yet you, you can't you can't be enlightened. You can't really even be a good person in a certain sense uh, while not being conscious to that. Now, sometimes people can say, "Well, I, um, you know, I'm not a vegan, but but I eat meat that has been um, humanely raised," and you can't. That's not good enough because, like, for example, like. Um, Purdue Farms was, was um, some time ago sued by Humane Society because they, they were putting on their packaging, our chickens are humanely raised when they were not. They were raised in these factory farms of, of 30,000 chickens in a, in a dimly lit, you know, um, oh, a horrible condition, just packed. I mean, they, they can hardly walk. I mean, it, it, it's really horrible the way they're treated. So again, you can't rely on the law. In other words, for example, even according to the law, because the problem in the United States is the people who make these laws about how we treat animals are the same people who are in the animal raising and the products industry, in the livestock industry. So they have these lobbyists, they have people in government, you know, in, in powers, positions of power that create the law, laws and rules. And for example, one rule that they created is like, let's say you have a, a hangar, this, this, this big um, building, dimly lit, you know, so smelling in, in urine and the nitrogen from urine that the workers have to actually wear gas masks to work in there, otherwise like it would, it would destroy their, their, um, their respiratory systems. Um, these chickens are packed there, right? And like if, if this building has a door attached to it leading to a 12 by 12 space of green grass, 
by law, they're allowed to call that free range. You know, so, so it's absurd. So in other words, like, that's why I say, like, you know, you can't really be a good person and, and not be a vegan because it's so difficult to navigate, to, to evade the, the complexities and, and the, the misinformation that, that comes about, you know, from, from really immoral laws related to, to how we raise animals. Um, now, just, I just, you know, in, in this whole, you know, we're talking about goodness now, and I just finished a 216 episode series on why we don't have a free will and why that matters. And this is very important here. So, like, I'm not saying that, that you know, that if, if you're not a vegan, you know, you're a, a really bad person, you know, objectively or fundamentally. Because, like, in other words, like, if, if you're not a vegan, if, if you're not compassionate toward the poor, you can't really blame yourself because you don't have a free will. You know, no, free will is a myth. I mean, Darwin, Einstein, Freud all understood this. Our world hasn't caught up with this. Um, I, I did a couple of books on this, a Manhattan TV show. I do a podcast on this. It's, it's something like Darwin's evolution. You know, it just, it hasn't caught up to society. Maybe in, in 50 years, everybody will get this free will thing. But the reason I say this is like, don't blame yourself. You know, if you're not a vegan, if you're not caring for, for people who really need your compassion, but then, you know, you might want to consider that um, even though things aren't up to us fundamentally, even though we don't have a free will, we are nonetheless held responsible, morally responsible for what we do and what we don't do. And I'm not saying, you know, what I'm saying is there, there's a divine justice at hand. In other words, and it's not fair, okay? You know, you have to like, I'd be the first person to say it's not fair. In other words, like God or the universe makes us, let's say, be indifferent toward animals, makes us like torture them, you know, you know, without caring about them, and then punishes us for that. So in other words, what I'm trying to say is like, you know, don't feel guilty because you don't have a free will if you're not as good as, uh, toward these animals and people as, as you could be. But keep in mind that, that nature, God, does tend to reward us when we're good and punishes us punish us when we're bad, when we're, you know, cruel. And a lot of people don't make the connection, but like, you know, for example, when people eat these animals, um, they, they get a lot of diseases, heart diseases, cancers, just so many kinds of diseases, diabetes, that are directly linked to animal consumption, to meat consumption. So like people are being punished, but they don't make the, the, connect, the connection that they're being punished because they're being bad. All right, so, um, now, again, goodness isn't just limited to the people and to the animals who are living now. It's also like we have to consider the people and animals who are coming after us, and especially in this case, the people. And what I'm referring to now is climate change. In other words, like if we continue basically doing nothing about it, the civilization we know will end within b before the, the century's over, over this next, you know, 80 years or so, there will be no more human civilization. Uh, average temperatures will be like, you know, hotter than, than, than the deserts, you know, hottest deserts in the United States. Throughout much of, of, of the world, um, there will be like water shortages, food shortages, there will be like pandemics because like as the temperature gets hotter, um, infectious diseases um, increase, so basically, you know, what, what I'm saying is like, we can't continue to deny, I mean like, again, this is another case where like, it's not really so much about enlightenment, you know, naturally if you if you're wanna be enlightened, you know, there's absolutely no way that you can deny climate change or, or not be doing your part, you know, you know to, to help address it. But, um, but this is also just a matter of basic, basic goodness. Again, like, you, you don't have a free will, so it's not fundamentally up to you, but if you're not concerned with climate change, with these people who haven't been born yet, you know, your children, great-grandchildren, uh, great-grandchildren, you know, these generations to come, you can't consider yourself a good person. And this is kind of like a uni unique situation in the history of humankind, because in past decades and centuries, one just didn't have to worry about future generations. You know, there was, there was very little that we could do in our lifetime that would affect future generations. But we live in a different world. I mean, I think like, you know, that's another reason why we don't, you know, use atomic bombs anymore, because it, it just like, it destroys the land. So, again, we have to just consider that 
that being good is not limited just to, to our lifetime and to the people and animals who live here. We need to be good for, for future generations. Okay, and, and finally, we need to be good to ourselves. You know, the problem for many people is um, they're not all that good to themselves because that, this isn't something that's really promoted so much in, in our society, in our civilization. So what happens like when they're not good to, uh, to themselves, remember, goodness is about happiness. Goodness is what create hap creates happiness. So to the extent that we're not good to ourselves, then we're not enlightened in that way, we're not going to be all that happy. The average level of happiness throughout the world is only 65% here in the United States, about 70. But even the happiest people in the United States, for example, are happy only 54% of the time. So we've got a serious happiness problem. And when people are not happy, they will not only seek happiness in risky, dangerous ways like eating too much, drinking, um, too much consuming um, drugs that, that are, are, are unsafe, that are harmful, that are risky. And, 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 and they'll eat, you know, um, they'll eat meat. They won't care. You know, if, if, people, if people aren't happy, you know, or as happy as they, they want to be, if people aren't good to themselves in that way, they will, they're, they're not going to be good to the animals. They're not going to be good to the people around their life because they'll be so consumed with, with this, this, you know, just gaining more happiness, indifferent to what their actions, you know, create, not just, again, for people living in this generation, but fu for future generations. A principle that, that comes to mind with this is kind of like if you're on an airplane, right? and you know there's some kind of trouble you know the the recommendation is that you put your airbag on first and then you address you know the needs of, of, of those around you if you were not to do that you might be wanting to help others but without being able to breathe you know you'd be very limited in in what you can do so again it's very important to enlightenment to be good to yourself, to be really happy, and to be a very good person, so you're rewarded. So, like to the extent that you're very happy, then you're not focused on your happiness. You're not. You've got what you want because happiness really the only thing we uh, we want. I did a episode on this last week. So you know, again, look, when you're happy, you can focus on other people and on what enlightenment requires, demands. Okay. Um, now, goodness is also, you know, sometimes it's um, a matter of prioritization. You know, it's not just like, well, I'm going to be good and, and it's just, you know, it's so easy. No, sometimes, like, we have to make tough decisions, right? Like, for example, with climate change, we have to decide, oh, well, you know, we can live in relative comfort, you know, and, you know, without much struggle or sacrifice now. And that's a good, but we're sacrificing our kids and grandkids and their kids' future, all right? Or we can, um, we can continue to, to enjoy eating meat, right? And, um, but that sacrifices, I mean, like there's like 60, about 65 billion farm animals each year are, are, are literally tortured, you know, before they get to our plates. And, you know, um, we'll be doing an episode on this. So like, you know, so there's two kinds of goodness. Are you going to be good to yourself in that way and just li live an easy life at the expense of all this, this suffering of the animals and, and the climate? Or are you go going to like do what's right, you know, toward the climate, toward these animals and, and you know, sacrifice a bit? I mean, like, uh, I think, you know, to, to a great extent, you could find that ultimately it's not a, sa a sacrifice. Ultima ultimately, let's say with the animals, you become healthier, you enjoy life more, but it might feel like a sacrifice. But goodness often requires that. It's prioritizing. It's weighing, you know, one good, the, the greater of two goods, the lesser of two evils. And it's very important to know that. So you basically, you know, must know how to be good. And a lot of this requires knowledge. A lot of people, you know, will eat animals because they, you know, they tell themselves, oh, my God, these animals just don't, don't feel pain, you know, which is so totally absurd. I mean, we have animal laws, you know, laws against being cruel to animals um, here in the United States because we, we know, we know that they feel pain. We know they, anybody who has a cat or a dog or a bird knows they feel pain. Um, but so, so, like, you know, being good, you know, requires knowledge and information and same with climate change we you know if, if you if you read up on climate change this hobby, hockey stick graph where the the co2 level just like is about like a horizontal line from the 70s then all of a sudden it starts shooting up 
you know, and, um, and the, the, the temperature follows that same, you know, that's why it's called a hockey stip, a very sharp, steep um, increase, you know, that, that follows in temperature, you know, once the carbon dioxide goes up. So you need to know these things. Like in, in this complicated world, to be good, to be enlightened, you need to be informed. You, you need to have access to this knowledge. Um, so, all right, so back to happiness. Um, if this, this show is about goodness, Aristotle, you know, said happiness is the highest good. You know, I mean, if you want to be good to, to the people in your life, to animals, to future generations, the best thing you can do is help them to feel happier. You know, because again, once, once they're feeling as happy as they want to feel, because happiness isn't just the highest good, it's the only thing we want. Anything else we want, Aristotle also knew this, is just the idea that like anything we want is just a means to happiness. If it's not happiness, the only reason we do anything is because we predict and expect that it's going to create more happiness um, or maintain our happiness. So basically it's the idea that like as we become happier and get what we really want from life, then we can divert our attention to look to or around us to see who's suffering, who needs compassion, you know, including animals, um, and again, thinking about future generations, and act in an enlightened way toward them. Okay, um, now again, a lot, of, a lot of goodness has to do with other people, but a lot of happiness also has to do with other people. Um, when scientists ask people, what's your main source of happiness? And they've been doing this for decades, since the late 50s, you know, hundreds of thousands of people they've asked this. The number one answer is always, well, you know, my main source of happiness is other people. Generally, it's a, a spouse, a family member, you know, parents, children, brother, sister, and friends and all. Okay, so like generally, we, we tend to see other people as a source of happiness. But there's an, another component to this. Um, I practiced Orthodox Judaism for several years in the 80s, and one thing that I learned was um, there was kind of like a law or um, perhaps a suggestion that, that was made that, that one should only think of other people for the purpose of, being, of helping them. In other words, like if, if you want to think about somebody, you know, somebody in your life, whether it's your spouse or your friend or whoever it is, you know, don't think in terms of like what you can get from them. Don't think of them in terms of like, you know, being sources of pleasure and happiness. Think of other people in terms of how th they are opportunities for you to do good. So, so basically, like you're thinking of a person, and in your mind, again, you shouldn't be thinking, oh, what can I get from this interaction? What, what can I get from this? You should be thinking, what can I give to this? What, what does this person need, whether it's information or resources or time or just listening, whatever, that I have that I can offer them? And again, it's, you know, if you focus on their happiness, then you can help them the most. But that's, you know, that's, I think, something very important to being enlightened, to, you know, to having a proper view of people. Yes, other people are, you know, sources, great sources of our happiness. But if we see them and if we think about them from the perspective of there being opportunities um, to, for us to do good, that's a more moral, enlightened way to see other people. Okay. Um, now, all right, now, you know, goodness doesn't always mean pacifism. I, I think everybody knows this, like, you know, basically sometimes we have to defend ourselves either as individuals or as countries, you know, and, and ideally as, as the world becomes more enlightened, uh, we're not going to have to do this anymore. I, I imagine a thousand years, you know, neither people nor countries are going to be assaulting each other for any reason because we'll have outgrown this, we've evolved beyond this really primitive um, behavior, this primitive way of negotiating limited resources and all. But for the time being, you know, like if we were to be completely pacifist, then, you know, the, the people who would be running the world, and unfortunately to a certain extent it's like that already, are the people who just are to a great extent indifferent, who, who just like, you know, who don't have any problems uh, with, with gaining their happiness, their whatever they want at the expense of others. So again, you know, part of being enlightened, you know, it, it, you don't, it's not about being a pacifist. Sometimes we have to defend ourselves, we have to defend, you know, even the future generations to come. Okay, um, 
All right, so I think, you know, we've covered this, this, um, this question of goodness, I think, well. And, and, and then, you know, with, as with happiness, it's something that we should be practicing. You know, we should be thinking about more. We should be talking about it more. I mean, when's the last conversation you've had about the, the topic of good, goodness? You know, how to be a better person. Are you a better person? How, you know, what, what it requires. So um, when talking about happiness, I've, I've said many times, I used to do a happiness show about 15 years ago where I would talk about, well, the, the fastest, the most effective I believe way of, of creating a happier world is to begin teaching our kids, you know, K through 12 and through college, how to be happier. And I mean, it's such a no-brainer. Happiness, you know, information, knowledge is, anybody can understand it. And, you know, as long as we're going to be teaching our kids how to read, they have to read material. So, the, you know, it just makes complete sense that that material should be material on how to be happier. But again, you know, they should also be learning how to be good. In other words, like t here in the United States, there's a 50% divorce rate in first marriages. Why? Because people don't know how to be good to each other, how to like, and, and <laughs> all right, I got to like, you know, I consider myself, you know, enlightened, maybe not, not all very enlightened, but I just happen to not be good at relationships, all right? So, like, it's not like, you know, but we, why? Because, like, you know, I, <laughs> I don't know why, but if I, had, if I had learned this in school, you know, how to, how to be good toward other people, how to, like, demand that other people be good to, to me, you know, that, that probably would have helped out a lot. But just the, the basic idea is that it's not just, like, education shouldn't just be about, like, this, this knowledge to help one, like, get a job and, you know, all that stuff. It should be about happiness, and it should very much be about goodness. The, the more we understand what it is to be good and how to be good, the better we can be. All right, this is George Ortega. Thanks for watching. I will see you next uh, week on uh, the Ortega Path to Enlightenment. Thanks.